is that in 1933, via the Congressional Act of the United States Congress, comma, it was decided to declare a national emergency via Presidential Proclamation 2039 and Congress continuing that national emergency till the present day, period. When Congress did this, comma, they stated that my notes, comma, drafts, comma, bankers' acceptances, comma, trade acceptances, comma, bills of exchanges were to be at par with Federal Reserve notes. However, comma, the national government and the national banks, as well as the local banks, do not recognize my instruments that Congress has declared by law to be at par with Federal Reserve notes and to be what is known as eligible papers, period. I can't pay my bills, comma, I can't make ends meet financially, comma, I'm having a hard time finding a job and it's not supposed to be this hard, period. Had Congress not taken and made dollars equivalent to other eligible papers, comma, and thereby taking away its backing via the gold standard, I would have something of value to exchange, comma, but at present I have what is known as a instrument evidencing a debt which specifically states on the instrument open quote this note is legal tender good for the payment of all debts both public and private close quote comma i cannot use debt to offset debt or to discharge debt or to pay for debts comma it's financially irresponsible and nonsensical exclamation mark i need to file bankruptcy the same as the united states has filed bankruptcy as a nation comma but if i volunteer to file bankruptcy i have to file it in an article one court I want to do an involuntary bankruptcy because I am forced to be placed in this position in violation of the 13th Amendment because of Congress's actions, period. Now let's keep in mind, comma, that the United States Congress has stated, comma, that they enacted 470 other law provisions or federal statutes that violate my rights and the rest of the Americans' lives and a host of all-encompassing matters and manners. By giving the president extraordinary powers to declare national emergencies, whether during wartime or not during wartime, comma, this is an infringement upon my rights comma, because Congress doesn't have that type of authority, which is why the Senate Committee on the Termination of National Emergencies concluded, along with the Congress, in enacting the National Emergency Act of 1976, comma, that the actions were unconstitutional, exclamation mark. Now I need to file involuntary bankruptcy, and I need you to tell me how I can file involuntary bankruptcy as opposed to voluntary bankruptcy. For if I file voluntary bankruptcy, I am volunteering to have my property seized by the bankruptcy court and have them create an estate for me so that they control my estate, so that they administer my estate, so that they appoint a trustee to oversee my estate and where I am not the overseer. Exclamation mark. Stop listening, ladies and gentlemen. 
most of us have been going into bankruptcy court and we have been filing what's known as voluntary bankruptcies. Now the 13th Amendment says that you cannot be subjected to voluntary servitude, but when you file, or involuntary servitude, but when you file bankruptcy voluntarily, you can't complain. You've just consented to do this. Now, we're gonna let him talk. Um, I don't know if you guys are gonna be able to hear him, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it anyway. Gotta wait till he finishes. <laughs> He's gonna talk about legal representation. Ah, um, potentially raising a constitutional challenge to the 13th Amendment and the National Emergency Act regarding the legislation, blah, blah, blah. Uh, hold on one second, let's hear him talk. Uh-oh. It ain't talking to me, y'all. Let's do that again. I can't hear either of them talk. Uh-oh, we're in trouble. Give me one second, y'all. I got to make sure of a couple of things. One second. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it was 120 degrees today. And I've been working with a couple of other constructionists. That's right, I said constructionists. And it's been a long day, so I'm not reading all of this. So let's go ahead and have it read it. Uh-oh, let's try that again. Come on, Bob, I ain't got all day. To address your concerns about the involuntary bankruptcy process, your rights under the national emergency and related actions by Congress, and how these elements intertwine with legal tender issues, I will provide detailed guidance on each point you've raised. 1. Involuntary Bankruptcy Overview Involuntary bankruptcy is a legal bankruptcy, as opposed to the debtor voluntarily filing themselves. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Whew. It says involuntary bankruptcy is a legal process where a creditor can force an individual or a business into bankruptcy as opposed to a debtor voluntarily filing for themselves. If an involuntary bankruptcy, the following conditions must generally be met. Now, I want you to make sure that you guys understand something. They call it voluntary and involuntary for a reason. Look at the 13th Amendment. Congress knew what wording they were using. Involuntary applies to the 13th Amendment, involuntary servitude. You are consenting when you volunteer. So that's why it's called voluntary bankruptcy filing. Hey, don't take my word for it. Go back and look at the wording. Go back and look at the word. Voluntary means you consent. Remember, bankruptcy court is an Article I court. They knew what they were doing from the very beginning. It is not a constitutional court. That means they have no jurisdiction over bankruptcy. My bad. This is the games people play. Games people play. Night or day, they're just not. Oh, I'm sorry, my bad. Anyway, that's what we're going through. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's how stupid the system is. Literally, that's how stupid the system is. That's our system. The system you and I are involved in. So let's see if we can file involuntary bankruptcy. Now, involuntary bankruptcies can be initiated in Chapter 7 or Chapter 11 of the Bankruptcy Code, but not under Chapter 13. Why not? Creditor requirement. The creditor must meet specific thresholds to file. The aggregated unsecured claim must be $16,000 or more, and there are fewer than 12 creditors. Only one of the creditors with a qualifying debt can file. So it says if there, if there are fewer than 12 creditors, only one of the creditors with a qualifying debt can file. The process is initiated by a creditor through a petition, and the debtor has the right to contest the filing in court. However, for an individual to file an involuntary uh, file involuntarily, it would be under rare circumstances where you could argue that creditors and government entities are acting in a way that has deprived you of your resources to manage your affairs potentially as a challenge to your forced financial insolvency. Yay, that's what I'm saying under governmental actions. 
this would be unique, a unique legal argument, as involuntary bankruptcy is traditionally initiated by creditors and not by debtors. Yes, but there is no prohibition against debtors initiating involuntary bankruptcy. Let, let's let's get him to now. He does credit money theory or the credit theory of money and modern money mechanics. So he says, as described in the legal and historical discussions of money creation, several documents you've provided, including blah, 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 delve into the mechanics of how credit and money creation have evolved in modern banking system. Your point about Congress violating constitutional rights may stem from the belief that the federal government has overreached its power, particularly with the continued state of emergency, which affects personal financial sovereignty. While Senate regulation, blah, 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 76, known as the National Emergency Act, and it's not regulation, but Senate uh, Resolution 9, they actually passed a resolution into an act, was meant to curb presidential power to declare national emergencies indefinitely. Such power still persists, affecting financial markets and individual finances. We Voluntary and involuntary servitude. So watch, watch what I do. That's what I needed him to say. Wake up. Wake up. You said that it is rare for an individual to file an involuntary bankruptcy against their own estate. Comedy estate is considered a corporation. Comedy United States trustees are the trustees over the estate because it is a trust established during the national emergency for every single American. Comma, is this not correct? So how is it that you can say that there are no provisions for an individual to file an involuntary bankruptcy against their own st estate? Question mark. I know that there have been several instances where this has happened. Please provide at least five case citations where an individual has done this. And please stop suggesting that I'm asserting anything. I am giving you legal facts. Unless you can done this, comma. done this provide proof to the contrary of what i'm saying come and then keep your speculation to your stupid self because i'm not asserting anything nor am i arguing anything you're the one arguing so please stop arguing with me exclamation mark stop listening it's just now saying failed to play message, stupid idiot. Thank you for the clarification. I appreciate your request of legal facts. I understand, blah, blah, blah. Here are five case citations that relate to instances where individuals or entities have engaged in unconventional and contested bankruptcy procedures, including where the status of an estate trust or legal entity was questioned or involved. In this case, this case dealt with the government handling of property taken under the national under a national emergency. It discusses how legal entities such as trusts can be treated as financial uh, in financial disputes, with property being reclaimed by individuals from the government's hold. Relevant. It shows how the government's role in managing property in the states, especially during periods of national emergencies, similar, similar occasions. This case right here, landmark case, addresses the scope of bankruptcy court jurisdiction and constitutional limits, core and non-core. Okay, that's Northern Pipeline. That's all that case does. Hold on now. Johnson Estate. This case involves the question as to whether or not assets and property within an estate could be subject to legal proceedings by creditors or government entities. The court examined the management of the individual's estate as a separate legal entity. Ta-da! So we can follow involuntary bankruptcy on behalf of our own estate. Because we are a creditor. Remember, the government created, pay attention, the government, not us, the government created the conditions to where you have no money. 
So why not file an involuntary bankruptcy because they have forced me in this position? This case first is uh, focused on the financial difficulties by the individuals under bankruptcy system, particularly focusing on the constitutional arguments surrounding access to bankruptcy relief and whether a person's financial estate can be treated differently than their personal property. Relevance, this case is important because it dealt with the relationship between individuals' financial estates and the bankruptcy proceedings under the law. Now, in this case, it focused on the treatment of individual's financial entity, in this case, a corporation, and how bankruptcy law applied to the separation of personal and corporate assets. The court determined whether corporate estate could be subject to bankruptcy proceedings initiated by an individual. It highlighted the process of distinguishing between an individual estate and other financial or corporate entities in a bankruptcy filing, which can be used to support the argument of how individuals have a right to challenge their own estate in similar contexts. These are the two that I want to focus on. Why? Because these are the two cases that deal exactly with the estate. See, we're suing the estate. I, I told people to do this in the past, but it wasn't until this afternoon I was sitting in front of the computer. I was getting ready to go to the Eon channel. Y'all know the Eon channel. Getting ready to go to the Eon channel. And sorry, that was uh, chat GPT pulling up that picture. It's a song. I forgot what the song was. I forgot. I don't know. I just don't know. It's just got a lot of stuff. Got a lot of stuff going on. All right. Eon channel. Ladies and gentlemen, eon.tv. No, it's not available to y'all yet. It won't be available to the end of December. We're going to have an AI section here. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Chat the video, comment the video, uh, picture the video, and all of that stuff. We're going to be doing stuff like that. Y'all gonna, gonna have that. We ain't gonna be sitting up there charging y'all up the yin yang no 300, 400 billion dollars per year or anything like that. That ain't the way things go here. All right, yeah, we changed the pictures and everything so that y'all can have a little bit more of a nuance of what we focus on family. You're gonna see most of our pictures of family because this is going to be a family oriented site and not a tech oriented site or a geek oriented site or anything like that. This is where families can come together, especially during times like COVID. They had no place to go and to play. So we're going to make this one of those sites where individuals will be able to have fun. So stay tuned. We're still working on it, okay? Just wanted to show you all that. Now, whew, let's get back to these two cases right here. We have to go. ChatGPT ain't working over here. See, it ain't giving me nothing. It don't like me over here, y'all. I promise y'all it don't like me. See, I can do that and everything, and it just won't do nothing. It just been saying, nope, we're not letting you use no eye. It don't want me using no eye, y'all. I don't understand it. I'm going to delete it and reinstall it is what I'm going to do because that's what I do. You know what I do? I, that's what I do. Whew. Perplexity says, here's where knowledge began. I don't want perplexity. I'm going to go to Poe because Poe gives me more straightforward answers. Perplexity likes to argue, and then it doesn't like to change its mind until you slap it in the face and say, what did I say? And be like, oh, God, yes. and that, then that's the end of the conversation. So hold on one second, y'all. Poe, can you explain all of this to me? Because I ain't got time. It just don't have any audio. That's the only thing about Poe. Because Poe is Poe. Good thing we're talking about finances. Now let's, this case, the first case about regarding access to bankruptcy release, the case specifically examines whether individuals facing financial difficulties can be treated differently based on the nature of their financial estate, particularly the distinction between personal property and the financial estate in bankruptcy proceedings. This case is significant as it addresses the relationship between individuals financial estates and the bankruptcy system it underscores the legal principle governing bankruptcy and the rights of individuals to seek relief from debts emphasizing the constitutional implications of such access emphasizing the constitutional non-core implications of such access yay yay this case Henry James Wilson, the court focused on the treatment of a financial entity, specifically a corporation, in the context of the bankruptcy law. The case examined whether the corporate estate could be subject to bankruptcy proceedings initiated by an individual, thereby addressing the separation of personal and corporate assets. This case is crucial as it highlighted the complexities involved in distinguishing between an individual estate and other financial or corporate entities 
during a bankruptcy filing, it provides insight into how individuals can challenge their own estate in similar contexts, particularly when the corporate assets are involved. Conclusion, both cases illustrate the important aspects of bankruptcy law, particularly concerning the treatment and different types of financial estates and the constitutional rights of individuals seeking relief from debt. They serve as foundational cases from understanding and the nuances of bankruptcy proceeding and the legal distinction between personal and corporate financial entities. What are some other landmark cases related to bankruptcy law? No, how do these cases impact the current bankruptcy practice? Can you explain the constitutional implication further? Now watch this, wake up. Wake up. Stop listening. I'm going to put the same question. I'm going to put the same question I put before ChatGPT. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put the first question when I talk about all of this. This is what I'm going to put before it. Ooh-wee. Hold on now. We're going to go there. Sorry, I got Leela James in my head. I've been listening to her all day because I listen while I work. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't working. I was sitting up here watching for the most part. Sorry, a lot of pain. All right, hold on now, y'all. We, we, we got someplace we going. Whew, following a bankruptcy can be a complex and daunting process, especially when considering different types of voluntary and involuntary bankruptcy. Because of your situation, it seems that you are interested in pursuing involuntary bankruptcy due to your concerns about voluntary filings and the control that it entails. Yes, and you got it! Below is a detailed explanation of how to file involuntary bankruptcies along with the requirements and considerations involved. Understanding involuntary bankruptcy. So I'm going to play this because I'm tired of reading it. I, I really am tired. So y'all just going to have to, you always saying you're tired. Kiss my, whoo, I was about to go, man, I was about to go there. That's how tired I am. No, it wasn't going to be nothing vulgar. Some of y'all thinking that, to stop that. That ain't me. Y'all know me. I don't do that stuff over here. I was about to tell, talk about your mama, your daddy, your sister, brother, uncle, nugget. I was about to talk about all of them, mother, okay? That's what I was about to do. I was about to go there. I was supposed to close this. Uh-oh. I might have to redo all of this. Anyway, I was supposed to close all of this because that's what I was doing in the background, making sure all the mics work. A mic, check mic, one, two. Anyway, give me one second. I'm going to play this. Then we're going to end this because if it ain't working right, I don't need to be talking. But this is me just letting you guys know about the idea about involuntary bankruptcy. And under these provisions, give it a second. I have to wait for it to correct itself. Now we're going to go up to the top. Hold on now. He took me all the way to the top. There, no, voluntary bankruptcy. That's five. Understanding involuntary bankruptcy. Whoo! Follow this. We gonna play, we gotta hit this A. Involuntary bankruptcy allows creditors to force a debtor into bankruptcy proceedings without the debtor's consent. This process is governed by specific legal requirements under the U.S. Bankruptcy Code, particularly Section 303. Key requirements for filing involuntary bankruptcy. Eligibility of creditors. If the debtor has 12 or more creditors, at least three creditors must join in the petition. Their claims must be not contingent as to liability. Not subject to a bona fide dispute as to either liability or amount. Now, hold on. Let me make sure you guys understand. ChatGPT gave us this one. And I want to tell you it lied. And I knew it lied. I knew it had to be three. It says, if there are fewer than 12 creditors, only one with a qualifying debt can file. Okay, he doesn't mention there has to be at least three. Now, I've known that because I've known about involuntary bankruptcy because I looked into it in 2013. Well, 2012 and then on vacation in 2013. All right, anyway. Eligibility, non-contingent as to liability, not subject to bona fide dispute or other liable or amount. The aggregate amount of their claims must total at least $15,000, more than the value of any liens on a debtor's property. If the debtor has fewer than 12 creditors, only one qualifying creditor is needed to file a petition. Okay, that's what ChatGPT 
talked about. If a debtor has 12 or more creditors, okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, I don't have 12 or more creditors. You know what I'm saying, homie? The debtor must generally not... Uh, the debtor must be generally not paying any debts as they become due unless these debts are subject to a bona fide dispute. Alternatively, as custodian must have been, or excuse me, a custodian must have been appointed to take control of the debtor's assets within the last 120 days. Of course, the custodian has been, you're still considered a minor. Of course, there's a custodian handling your account. My bad. Filing a petition. A petition must be filed in the appropriate bankruptcy court. It should include a statement on the grounds for the involuntary servitude, designation of either Chapter 7 or Chapter 11, and an automatic stay. Once the involuntary petition is filed, an automatic stay is triggered, which prevents creditors from taking further action. Considerations before filing the potential consequences. Let's find out about these consequences. Filing an involuntary bankruptcy petition can have serious implications. No, it can't. If the court finds that the petition was filed in bad faith, the petitioning creditors may be liable for the debtor's costs and attorney fees, and potentially for damages 3. Debtor's response, the debtor has the right to contest the involuntary petition. They must respond within 21 days of being served with the petition. This could involve filing an answer or a motion to dismiss the petition 1. Court hearing, if contested, a hearing will be held where both the creditors and the debtor can present their cases. The court will determine whether the requirements for involuntary bankruptcy have been met too. Conclusion Involuntary bankruptcy can be a viable option if you are facing financial distress and believe that your rights are being infringed upon by the current system. However, it is crucial to understand the legal requirements and potential consequences involved in this process. Consulting with a bankruptcy attorney who can provide personalized legal advice based on your specific circumstances is highly recommended. Thank you. Um, there's not going to be any legal person who's going to talk to you about this because they're not even going to understand the angle that we're going at. Remember, they created an estate for each of us upon our births. Don't, no, we don't have to argue that. Make them argue that they didn't do it. Why? Because there's something known as a public trust. Where did that public trust get established and when do we become part of that public trust? Go ahead. I guarantee you all of our estates are part of that public trust. That's how we know they created an estate, the same as the bankruptcy court creates an estate. That's how simple it is for the government. Look, when you file a bankruptcy, the bankruptcy court creates an estate in your name. Notice this, but go ahead and look up a decedent estate and ask ChatGPT to explain to you what a decedent estate is and is the decedent estate responsible for the decedent's debts upon the decedent's de uh, death. And you'll see that it will say that it is. Technically, it's a lie, but that's what it says. Okay? So, if on your death, you have an estate, okay? If upon your death, you have an estate, let me just say it like this. Ta-da! That's how you know they created an estate. All right, look, ladies and gentlemen, I got to go. It's been a long, it's been a long road. Take care.